brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace are yours this day from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Marley was dead to begin with. Those are the haunting first words of Charles Dickens' famous novella, A Christmas Carol. Now, I'm sure that many of us are familiar with that little story, or at least the wonderfully faithful musical adaptation featuring the Muppets. But in case there are some of us who need a little catching up, A Christmas Carol is the story of Ebenezer Scrooge. Uh, now, Scrooge is a money lender, the kind of person who specializes in giving uh, short-term high-interest loans, usually to people who couldn't get help from the bank. I guess even back in the 1800s, you had to get screened. Uh, so this is Scrooge, and we're not supposed to like him, and this is clear uh, from the way that he treats his employees, specifically his clerk, Bob Cratchit, uh, and his general miserly ways in his personal life. Uh, and on top of this all, he has a general disdain for the upcoming Christmas holiday, which he considers to be a humbug. Now, Scrooge had been in business with a partner by the name of Jacob Marley, who I hope is, who uh, was, I hope is clear by now, dead by the time the story starts. Uh, one night, however, Scrooge is visited by Marley's ghost. Uh, and to Scrooge's great surprise, the specter appears wearing long, heavy iron chains and fetters wrapped around his arms and trailing behind him. And the spirit speaks to Scrooge, informing him that these chains were forged during his life uh, through his deeds of greed and his single focus on his business and his bottom line rather than on his relationships with others and the good of humanity in general. The ghost goes on to inform Scrooge that his own chains are heavier yet, that he has been forging them his entire life. But Marley tells Scrooge he will get a chance to change his ways. He'll be visited by three more spirits, and these spirits will give him visions of Christmas, because it is Christmas Eve when the story is occurring. He'll be visited by the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Well, to cut the rest of the story short, the spirits visit Scrooge, and it works. He amends his ways, and when he wakes up on Christmas morning, he is a changed man. He makes amends with his clerk, Bob Cratchit, with his nephew, Fred, uh, and in the years to come, Dickens writes, he became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Now that is the story of A Christmas Carol. And now for those of us familiar with the novella, uh, in case that was all a bunch of review, did you know? That the full title of the story is A Christmas Carol in Prose Being a Ghost Story of Christmas. There, we all learned something. Now, you may be wondering why here in late September, I'm starting out a sermon by telling you a story that happens around Christmas. Let's take another look at our gospel reading from Luke. I think some parallels will begin to emerge. Luke writes, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. All right, so perhaps this man isn't quite the miser that Scrooge is, but he certainly has the same priority of money over people. And the words to come will serve to confirm his misanthropy. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. Now that that's set up, Luke gets on with the meat of the story. The poor man died and was carried away with the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades where he was being tormented. He looked up and saw Abraham with Lazarus by his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip his hand in the water and come and cool my tongue for I am in agony. But Abraham said, remember that during your lifetime you received good things and Lazarus in like manner evil things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, no one can get from here to there or from there to here. Clearly, 
this rich man in Luke's story has suffered a fate similar to that of Jacob Marley, and he is about to ask for the same chance that Marley got, uh, for a warning to go out to his friends and associates. He says to Abraham, then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them so that they cannot come to this place of torment. Abraham insists that they should listen to Moses and the prophets. The man pleads that they might listen to someone risen from the dead, but Abraham cuts him off again. Now here is where things uh, take a turn away from Dickens. Uh, the rich man's Marley-like desire is not granted in the story. His brothers never receive the chance that Scrooge gets, the chance to change their ways by getting a warning that they could not perceive with their own senses. They are stuck on their own, never to get that opportunity. Except I think they do, because I think they're us. St. Luke writes this warning, and be assured, a warning is what it is. This is what I was talking about with the kids up at the bucket, that the Bible works in many ways, and here it works to warn us. And this warning comes right in the middle of the most urgent part of St. Luke's Gospel. Jesus has his face set to Jerusalem. We keep saying it every week because it's so vitally important to this second half of Luke. And so everything Jesus does during this whole section of the gospel is done with the urgency of salvation in mind. This story comes right after a series of urgent parables. Remember last week's story of the dishonest manager. And right before a series of urgent sayings. Jesus gives this warning because he wants his followers to urgently examine their lives to urgently take stock of their relationships, because ultimately that's what this story is about, the relationship, or lack thereof, between the rich man and Lazarus. Jesus wants his followers to notice things and to act as though there is not much time left, because at this point in Jesus' ministry for him, there's not. So take a second. Take the rest of the day if you need it. Ponder your own life. I'm not saying that anyone here is on the level of Ebenezer Scrooge, and quite frankly, if you are, you've done a great job of hiding it from me for the last four years. But in each of our lives, there are gaps. Gaps between the way that we treat others and the way that God sees them. Gaps between how we use our resources of time and effort, as well as our financial resources, and how those resources are used and managed in the kingdom of God. It is just these gaps, and paying attention to them, that our reading from Timothy points to today. Where the young pastor Timothy is exhorted to pursue righteousness, godliness, love, faith, endurance, and gentleness while preaching to others that they should not trust in the financial whims of this world, but rather trust in God and thereby be emboldened to generosity. This is the call of Jesus in our lives today. To bridge those gaps. To reach out in love to our fellow people, our neighbors our fellow creations of God, to embrace them in love, not so that we can avoid some Marley-like chains, not so that we can build a bridge for ourselves to get out of Hades and into the bosom of Father Abraham. For we know that those chains have been cast away and that bridge is already built in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Rather, we embrace our neighbors in love because of the love that we have been shown. We care for others emotionally, financially, and in all sorts of ways because we know that we have been cared for by Jesus. And in doing all these things, in bridging these gaps that Christ himself has reached across, we take hold that life that really is life.
Thanks be to God.